But we've heard that milk is not is not pro-inflammatory and it may be anti-inflammatory, but the latest research shows that milk doesn't actually protect you against osteoporotic fractures, which was what are osteoporotic specialty. fractures, other than hard to say. <laughs> uh, they're, they're bone fragility fractures or uh, having a hip, you know, hip fracture, wrist fracture. So fracture these are the things that spine. tend to become more common as you get Brittle older. Bone disease. I think about them. brittle bone disease is what is commonly known as, and uh, it's something that affects about one in three women. So it's incredibly uh, common. Yes, so you start with a wrist fracture in your 60s, then you might get a loss of height due to vertebral fracture, then in your 80s, uh, a lot of you know, highly susceptible to hip fractures, which can really end up changing your life. So really important, big epidemic of this. We were telling everyone 10 years ago to drink more milk, particularly around the menopause, this would protect you. Which but, is what I thought you were supposed to do. Yes. Well, that was up to very recently, the latest advice. But all the actual evidence now suggests that uh, milk drinkers have no uh, protection against hip fracture compared to non-milk drinkers. And it sort of makes sense because the biggest milk drinkers in the world are the Dutch and the Scandinavians, and they have the highest fracture rates in the world. So, so all of that calcium is in your milk and it's going to protect you? This is it's all, all turns, turns out, out to be, be nonsense? nonsense. Yes. Uh, uh, th that's... That's what the science is now telling us. And, you know, there's many other sources of calcium. We always think of milk as the only source of calcium, but actually there's so much in green leafy vegetables, in, in kale, in broccoli, in nuts, in almonds, uh, all kinds of different areas where you can get much more easy access to, to this calcium. And so I don't think we should be really pushing milk as much as we, we have been. And is that true for all? All dairy, so we talked yeah, about think, milk. I think, Jonathan, it's important to pick up on the um, osteoporosis question here reg regarding milk, that whether um, all dairy should be classified as not being helpful in that situation. So there's studies that have uh, taken place in um, care homes, for example, where they will take you know, a number of different care homes and some care homes will have fortified uh, the diet or sorry, added to the diet dairy. Now, this isn't just milk, though. This is like adding yogurt, cheese and other dairy and then other care homes that haven't. So it's part of a, a clinical trial. The care homes that add dairy to the diets of the people that are living there, they do have a reduction in lots of different um, unfavorable health outcomes, including fractures. Overall, what we know from population studies is people that consume more dairy have lower rates of type 2 diabetes. That's really consistent, the evidence for that. We also know populations that have a higher intakes of dairy have lower rates of cardiovascular disease. It's less consistent, but the majority of the data would support that. And we're starting to understand mechanistically why that is. We also know that people that have higher intakes of dairy tend to have uh, better uh, weight overall. And we also know that dairy may be protective against some cancers. So there's really consistent evidence that people that have higher intakes of dairy have lower risk of colon cancer, for example. But then we need to look at the different types of dairy to see, um, you know, which types are more protective than other types. And I think the best way we as nutritionists would separate them out is typically the fermented and non-fermented. And then once we look at the fermented, then we'd separate them out according to whether they're like liquid or hard. So when we talk about fermented, we mean cheese, we mean yogurt. When we're talking about the non-fermented, we mean milk and we mean butter. So to make sure I've got that, you're saying like overall, actually, when you look back at people living their entire lives and what they ate, then actually the people who are eating dairy have tended to look healthier. But the, within that, it's like there's this mix of different things. And so some of those dairy might be really quite good for you. Some of those dairy might not be very good for you. And you mix it all together. And on average, that might be better than someone who's not eating dairy. And I guess the risk always is, you know, are they drinking Coca-Cola as an alternative? You know, what, what are the the alternative choices, you know, as as you've explained to me many times? Is that the picture? So it's quite complex compared to, to many of these things where maybe it's just sort of clear that if you eat, you know, a whole grain, it's better than a highly refined grain. Yeah. So dairy is a huge food group. And so whilst we can say, broadly speaking, if you consume more dairy, you tend to be healthier, 
we need to look at the, all of the different components of the food groups as well. There's also quite a lot of clinical trial data that we can draw on as well to look at whether um, dairy itself is what's improving health or whether it's all the other factors that normally complicate um, how we understand a food impacts our health. So is it that people that have, um, you know, higher overall diet quality tend to consume more dairy or is it the dairy itself? And, and what's the answer? So... My interpretation of the evidence is that for cheese and for yogurt, it's the dairy itself that's conferring a favourable impact. And we're starting to understand why this is as well. The data, as, as Sarah's saying, on um, cheeses and yogurts is actually stronger than for milk. And um, I don't think uh, there's comprehensive data about it being fracture protective, but it's certainly... Uh, it's suggested that way, certainly. And I, I think all the fermented dairies have all these extra advantage of the probiotic microbes in there because we're talking about fermented dairies. These contain probiotic um, microorganisms that we know now from clinical trials are good for the immune system. They you know, have an effect within a few weeks. They do hang around in our, in our gut to energize the other microbes mm -hmm. there have lots of effects we still don't understand in our body. And I think we sh should still be pushing those. And all the evidence about yogurt and cheese is much more positive than for milk alone. That's amazing. Before we dig into the individual things, the, the number two question that we had from literally like about a thousand people was about full fat versus lower fat dairy. And I guess this can apply right across whether it's milk or if it's cheese. Um, and lots and lots of people saying, um, well, the government advice makes really clear that I am supposed to swap my full fat milk for low fat milk or my full fat cheese for low fat cheese. And we did our research and both the UK government and the US government are currently saying that. Um, I know that you uh, don't always agree with whatever the existing um, advice, which we know goes through a process that means sometimes it's a bit out of date. What's your personal views on this? Well, I think there's no evidence at all. That